Bienvenue, welcome to everyone. C'est un plaisir de... Welcome, welcome everybody. It's a pleasure to co-moderate with Gilles Raguin from Foundation Léon Barre, um, which is a very well known to all of us. And well, we have quite a tight schedule ahead and um, we see in the agenda that we're going to go around the world talking about addictology, infectiology, viruses. So we're going to go from Saint-Dizier in Paris to New York. And now we're going to start with Saint-Dizier. So this is Pascal Melin from Saint-Dizier. Hello, hello everybody, Mr. Chair, dear friends, thank you, thank you very much for having invited me, thank you for this invitation once more. I am responsible for an internal medicine and an addictology ward and uh, well, for the last 10 years, I have been sharing life experiences with um, people um, infected with hepatitis. And I'm sure that you're not going to learn too much. If you have anything to learn here, it's because there may be gaps. And these are my disclosures. So we need to finish our task for 2021, we're supposed to be eradicating hepatitis C in 2021, but let's forget about this, not happening. But maybe for 2030, it may be possible. Now, if we have a look at this slide, we see the different countries where the eradication is possible for 2030. So this is France, you know that Iceland has eradicated hepatitis C. Egypt announced this week that there's a plan in spite of their major epidemic. Well, they're following the path to eradicate the epidemic and hepatitis C um, in 2030. So we see that there are several countries which decided not to, to abide by that. And actually, globally, we can say that it's not happening uh, before 2050. And uh, this includes countries like Luxembourg, so quite uh, quite rich countries. So this makes us consider different issues. We remember Turenne, uh, who said that she wanted uh, universal access. And um, I said, well, it's not normal that all uh, patients cannot access uh, treatment. So we are fighting for this universal access to treatment. And um, there was this uh, national strategy for health proposing a simplified path to, to um, guarantee access to everybody. So we have screened 300,000 people, 300,000 people who could access to treatment or some of them died. So it's quite a large number. And there are, there are still 65,000 people infected. And if I'm referring to this figure, it's because it's one out of 1,000 people. So here is the cascade, the barometer that we are trying to follow. And you can see here that we have 230,000 people in 2004. And we're talking here about 79,000 people uh, in 2023 that are affected. So at least half the people do not know that they're affected. And you see that uh, in 2040, we are talking about 10,000 treatments. Then we move to 19,000 thousand treatments and now in 2023 we have a uh, 40 uh, sorry 4 thousand treatments so it's going to be complicated to eradicate this in 2030 even in 2030 so this is the problem with uh, our screening strategy today so we're talking about one person out of um, 1000 and uh, it's quite complicated to find this person and of course, general screening, screening is not interesting if we're talking about this ratio. So we have to think about this targeted 
screening. So we are thinking about several conditions that we need to respect. So the evolution here is about putting in parallel different screening tests. So in 2014, we had uh, 2 million 600,000 serologies. And actually, if I had uh, shown you the curve of serology of hepatitis C and HIV, it would be the same. So we moved from uh, 2.6 million tests to 3.6 million tests. And we're talking about this higher number of tests. And actually, you can see that we're screening much more women, even though we're treating many more men. So we have a problem with the screening. And we uh, were not able to get in contact with certain populations that need to be screened. So here we have the um, targeted screening in France, uh, drug users, psychiatric population, whiteheads. We, this is because of blood transfusions. There are many people who may suffer from hepatitis C, people in precarious conditions. Um, detained population in prisons, and we have the chemsex uh, people as well. And uh, I also wrote here rolling. Rolling is this experience where you boost hepatitis C, where you recall about hepatitis C, and uh, you get all the data from previous year, and then you discover that some of the people who were treated in the past, well, they know that they had hepatitis C, but they need to come back to, um, to the health system in order to follow their treatment. And uh, these are very positive experiences. Now I'm going to tell you about other experiences. This is the road trip. These are activists for hepatitis C treatment. And here, they, well, they make a road trip in the region of Bourgogne in France, and then they uh, try to propose a simplified path to treatment to patients. And well, there are more and more uh, screening in psychiatry. There are punctual actions for screening, and this has allowed us to to reach much more people. There are 4.58 more patients affected by hepatitis C amongst the psychiatric population. So we uh, have to target them. And also, there are cer certain infections without having used any substances. Another experience that is fascinating, and it was presented by Hélène Donadieu here years ago, is the ECON experience, where we have patients who receive vouchers, and then they can try to reach people in their community and invite them to the screening. And then these people who are bringing other people, they will receive a financial contribution. And in a few weeks, thanks to this word of mouth, we can reach thousands of people. And we have in certain communities a prevalence of 8% of hepatitis C. So actually, we are able now to reach certain people who were out of our structures because they were out of the world of addictology. So this is, you know, it may be, it may lead to some ethical issues, the fact of paying people to bring other people, but at least it's a strategy to move towards eradication. Should we couple screening of hepatitis C with uh, uh, mammograms? Because, well, this is a positive experience. I'm going to tell you about uh, this experience. This is in Montpellier, and as many other cities like Bordeaux, Strasbourg, well, we are committed to zero hepatitis. But uh, in Montpellier, the strategy didn't work, and we found out that, well, maybe we, it would be a good idea to suggest to all women who are going to get a mammography to propose uh, the screening. And we're talking about like 2,000 women, so maybe we can save one or two from hepatitis C. And uh, yes, indeed, that's what we did. So 
here, of course, we're not talking about a targeted population, we're talking about um, general population and then this brings to the issue of cost effectiveness of this kind of strategies. But then we also evaluated. I'm not going to tell you about serology or trod or uh, the bivalves, the certain labs that could not treat through uh, this test. And uh, we also used uh, POCs with different experts in different sites. So this is the kind of delocalized biology that could uh, lead us to get closer to the users. So these are the different tools for evaluation. So we made huge efforts in that regard. We also ran uh, non-invasive uh, methods and uh, biop because biopsies were quite uh, bothering. So we tried to avoid these biopsies through different blood tests like a fibro test and fibromed and also FITCAD and uh, elastometry test or elastography. And, uh, but of course, this always entails a problem of accessing to this kind of devices and test. But when it comes to evaluation, we were not sparing our means. So today, if you want to access a fibro scan, it's true that it's complicated, but we made huge efforts in that regard. So there are different studies. There's the CSABA scan, and this was about uh, using fibro scan for EXAPA uh, in order to uh, go a bit more strategically towards patients and try to screen them. And then, there's also this experience of bringing elastographies closer to the population and screening tests closer to the population. We have overcome biopsies and we have really uh, done very well with screening and with evaluation. And then we have treated, we have treated, you know, that in uh, 1980, Nine, there was this problem with hepatitis C and uh, these led to huge research and to the Nobel Prize of Medicine in 2020. So we have moved from 6% of healing to 75% of healing. And then there's this explosion in 2013 with 90% of uh, a healing of healing. So since 2014, Healing is not a problem anymore, so happy birthday, because it's been 10 years now that we can heal um, hepatitis C, so thanks to the Nobel Prize. But we still have some issues with regards to healing, because we have all the means, and in spite of that, we do not get to the entire population. We cannot eradicate it. So healing concerns 99.8% of people. So for these 0.2 people that are not healed, well, uh, there are many reasons to think that there's there's no reason to not to eradicate hepatitis C. So there's the AFF as well, who proposed a simplified route. And I would like to remind here the ambiguity in certain uh, addictology services about this simplified uh, path. Because with the simplified path, you just say, well, we're going to talk about to people who have a renal impairment or diabetes or an alcohol problem. We are alcohol specialists. However, whenever we find a hepatitis C, we uh, because we are not experts in, in uh, alcohol, well, we need to send uh, this to the alcohol, uh, to the hepatologist, but he, then he's not expert in alcohol either. So uh, this simplified path is not always the best solution. Maybe we should simplify it even more. And I think that any person suffering from hepatitis C needs to be treated as soon as possible and as close as possible uh, to um, home. So this is the Parcours project. This was presented in 2019, and it was about taking a number of patients. And uh, in this project, we compare different structures like hospitals, prisons, and also GPs. 
So in the left-hand side, you talk about 100 people with a serology of hepatitis C. So how many three people are going to be proposed a PCR, VHC? So it's true that in hospitals, well, we do very well, but in other settings, it's difficult to get uh, this PCR proposed. So how many positive PCRs we find? And then what's the follow-up? There are certain people in general medicine who can have a follow-up, but actually it's only in hospitals that we provide a good follow-up. And then when it comes to the final evaluation, so the final evaluation and checking that the patient is healed, well, we still find some gaps in many settings, in all of them. So the issue today is what else, what to do? So the benefits of healing, reduction of morbidity, mortality. So we have lots of publications. There are a huge waiting list in order to get a graft. And uh, actually certain people were suffering from uh, depression. And actually, if you treat their hepatitis C, they do very well. So this is regarding to the vascular issues um, involved in hepatitis C. So we have discovered that actually with healing hepatitis C, you can have many other beneficial manifestations. So we have many improvements in many other areas and there's also a better so socialization of these patients after getting healed from hepatitis C. So reinfection rates. This is a fundamental issue. We always have these uh, patients who have suffered six times from hepatitis C, and it's not only shem sexers or, or drug users. We're talking about other people. And non-injectors, well, we do not have reinfection in that population. And reinfection happens for people who inject drugs and actually we're doing a lot in order to avoid that. So it, the rate of reinfection is very low and it's not because a person is uh, infected that this person is not going to pay attention to getting reinfected. So we treat and then we support people to avoid them from being, or to prevent them from being injected again, uh, infected again. So big challenges, the challenges remain prisons, the 188 prisons in France. So how many people in order to get this zero hepatitis C, how many people do we have to treat? So how many people in the 489 uh, CZAPA in France? So we need uh, to get that goal for 2030 and actually there's also artificial intelligence coming up and they're going to replace you. So when we're thinking about screening one person out of 1,000, 1, well, if we're able to screen through certain models, we're going to get to universal screening and get to one out of 20 people. And then if we think about the biology characteristics and uh, the medication that patients have consumed, well, artificial intelligence is able to tell you that screening ratio is one out of five. So very soon we're going to ask artificial intelligence to, to do the job. So what else? Preventing reinfections generalizing uh, screening in prisons and in ZAPA, being better than artificial intelligence and having this hepato reflex. Tomorrow, we'll have patients who will suffer from hepatitis C. They will be suffering from NASH. There are going to be other treatments and if these patients are cirrhotic, it's going to be a disaster. So we need to evaluate the hepatic function of these patients. And also there has to be a preventive vaccine uh, against hepatitis C. So we need to keep looking for this vaccine. And uh, XAPA is a kind of Nashville. We're going to get lots of NASH 
uh, in this population, amongst this population. I remember a patient who was erotic and uh, he stopped his drinking. And uh, in spite of all the treatments today, he's erotic again. So hepatology, if we need to go back to, to, to something that uh, is reminded to us here, uh, Hepatology is the other dual pathology when we talk about addictology. So today, of course, I'm going to finish by mentioning um, a doctor that, that passed away this year. And uh, this is Michel Bonjour, who was uh, the president of the Association for Hepatitis. And he was an Epicurean and he was uh, xerotic and And he always had the right mindset. He used to talk to his um, to his liver, and actually he uh, healed from hepatitis C. But then he passed away. Thank you very much. Bravo for this recapitulation and these perspectives, dynamic, as always, innovative. Thank you very much for this recap and this innovative perspective. So we need to do better than artificial intelligence. Apparently, we have no. And epato reflex. Well, I think that this is a formula that can uh, that can have a certain success because with because new drugs for drugs obesity there's obesity, going to be a major and, uh, challenge sure challenge there will be a it will be a massive uh, challenge there are already, there's already uh, a traffic of uh, false medication of those, to treat uh, obesity drugs so um, i'm sure that your approach will be very successful as well Thank you. Thank you very much, Pascal. Thank you. Uh, and now, Pascal, regarding artificial intelligence, um, you showed a pilot said, study. With, um, and of course, with artificial intelligence, of course, of course it's quite seducing and attractive. Rather, but do you think uh, that this is something that we can pain. develop do in France? Do you think that this France? is something acceptable and feasible? Accept. What is your opinion, for example, if you had the financial means to launch an artificial intelligence experience in your region, in your large region, do you think that you would uh, get involved in that with a certain optimism and uh, willingness? No, actually, I'm quite afraid of it. I'm quite afraid of it because this model was working very well uh, as an experimental model in the US, but today, it's true that, you know, being screened is a risk of getting bad news, but it's also the opportunity to get healed. So, but of course, if an algorithm tells you that uh, you are at risk, you know, I'm not sure in France, but we have discussed about this and there are certain authorities here who are just paying attention to this because it could be a solution. I would like to make a call to everybody's responsibility. I think that eradication can be achieved without depending on artificial intelligence and without trying to target the right patients, the remaining patients to be screened. But the issue is, how much are you ready to accept that uh, there are certain patients who need to be treated and who remained uh, pending of treatment. So in the EXAPA, uh, do we want to be uh, pointed out and do, do, do we want to be threatened by a second wave of hepatitis C? I'm not sure. And today in different associations, well, we're quite afraid about these issues regarding artificial intelligence because we have fought quite a lot in order not to be stigmatized. So we do not want to be stigmatized by artificial intelligence. Thank you very much. So I think that we have Ernst Wisse here. Ernst is the Reduction des risques à Médecins du Monde France. 
Il est notamment en charge d'un certain nombre de programmes internationaux de médecins du monde sur les usages de drogue et sur euh, notamment spécifiquement le, le dépistage et la prise en charge des hépatites C, des programmes qui sont passionnants. Donc, euh, je te donne la parole, Ernst, tu as 20 minutes pour euh, nous faire ta présentation et puis on posera quelques questions après. Merci à toi d'avoir pu te rendre disponible pour la session d'aujourd'hui. Avec plaisir. <coughs> Merci. Hello, everyone. Um... I was just offered by the translators to do this in English, but I just want to make sure that everyone has headsets. You, it's very brave. You already showed up so early. You probably didn't come into the room to get a, a crash course in English. So just checking in if that's okay. Can I present in English? Oui, oui, tout à fait. Il y a des headsets Excellent. et il y a beaucoup d'anglophones aujourd'hui, donc c'est bon. All right, great. Aller. Well, Sorry, I'm just a little bit tired, so I'm very happy to do this in English. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ernst. I work with Médecins du Monde. And as you just heard, I'm uh, le référent de réduction de risque, so the, the harm reduction advisor. And I'm going to share my screen because I put a few slides together. So I'll be talking about one of our programs um, specifically addressing hepatitis C. Before I jump into my um, presentation, just a kind request if uh, to not take any pictures of the pictures that are in the slides, because everyone has obviously given permission to show the, the pictures, but some of them are quite sensitive. So just wanted to, to raise that. Um, yeah, it's a bit of a simple outline, but uh, I'll just quickly go through where we work, where, where we stand for as um, Mets on the Monde. How do we operate in low middle income countries specifically? And then I'll have a focus on hepatitis C. So in the recent years for MDM, we have quite increased our scope of interventions um, globally. Um, I'm sure some of you in the room know a lot more about how harm reduction started in MDM, specifically in France. So I will not touch so much on it, just to say that Mits on the Monde started um, harm reduction in, 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 in France in the, in the sense of Uh, we didn't operate international. We, we first operated in, in France. Um, then we stepped out. But unfortunately, because as you might have already touched upon in this conference, um, France isn't really going particularly forward in the subject of harm reduction. So we stepped back into and we're opening a program in, in Paris at the moment. So otherwise, we operate um, with, with interventions in Myanmar, um, Georgia, Armenia, Tanzania, Uh, Côte d'Ivoire, I'm currently designing a program in Iraq, and we support harm reduction interventions with our previous team in Kabul in Afghanistan, as well as now in Moscow, which is quite new for us. And we support from Tanzania in Benin, no, in Uganda and Burundi. So it it we quickly scaled up quite in a few countries, and, and I will later on have a specific focus on three countries that we'll talk about. So obviously when we, we speak about harm reduction in, in Medicine Monde, it has the first pillar is the public health perspective. And I'm sure you've already spoken about this before. Um, harm reduction is often much put into perspective of HIV. So apparently one in eight people, uh, approximately one in eight people who inject lugs are, are, are living with HIV. Um, importantly, the incidence among key populations is much higher. And I'm sure you already touched upon it. So I'll, I'll jump over this all very quickly. But we do focus on sex workers, people who use drugs, some LGBTI components um, in, in different countries for exactly that purpose. Now, as I will have a focus on hepatitis C, Médecins Monde started working on hepatitis C about the time that we still only had Antoferon and the first um, DAs came to the market. We, I think our first intervention was in Georgia where um, at the time DAs were still super expensive and we wanted to make sure that also people who, who inject drugs would have access to DAs. Obviously, there was a lot of stigma around People who use drugs can't take these, can't be adherent. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of resistance to providing these very expensive drugs to people that wouldn't comply with the requirements and would get reinfected anyway. And obviously, over the time, there's a lot of data and, and, and evidence now to suggest otherwise. But yeah, we still have a very strong focus on hepatitis C after so many years. 
um, for the obvious reasons, and I'm sure that you've all already spoke about it, one in four new infections is among people who inject drugs. Some data suggests even one in three new infections is among people who inject drugs. Now, obviously, we don't only focus on hepatitis C and HIV, but as you're all aware, in the international development space, these are two core public health um, areas that, that are, are much in the focus, but we obviously also defend um, any larger health issues such as overdose and and the whole range of, of issues you might have spoken through already. Now, we don't only focus on public health. Um, harm reduction has what we describe always as two pillars, one public health component and then obviously the human rights components. We work in places where people are often pushed out of their society and, and um, there's all the social stigma and the impact of social stigma of, and, and exclusion is one of our core um, battles in everywhere we work. So often we find ourselves working in extremely complicated places and it is not HIV people die of in a lot of places. It is purely because they are pushed out of society. They're in the most horrible situations and that ultimately is the biggest killer among people who inject drugs. So we defend that every human being is entitled to have the highest attainable standard of health. Um, and obviously you can imagine that it depends a lot on which country we operate, how much we can convince the government about the human rights component of harm reduction and how much we need to stay really in this public health perspective. Um, just to jump through a few guiding principles of when I say like, where do we stand for if as, as an organization working on harm reduction, it is very important, I believe, to mention that harm reduction is not just a way of doing things. It's not a better way of doing, you know, like a very abstinence oriented approach, but it is more than that. Without harm reduction, you wouldn't even meet the people. And that is a really important thing that we try to drive home every time this message. If you don't implement a harm reduction approach, you don't even know where the people are. And we are in many places where it's only through our outreach team, through our peer workers, that we actually read the people um, that are hiding in, in pretty bad places. We defend that there will be no elimination of hepatitis C. I mean, it's it has a nice ring to it, no elimination without de decriminalization. But we really believe that if you want to make any progress on infectious diseases such as HIV and hepatitis C, you will have to address the war on drugs. As long as we keep pushing people out of society, as long as we don't count people who use drugs as actual members of our society, it will be incredibly hard to reach any of the targets that the previous um, presentation already touched upon uh, the, the elimination targets for 2030. This, I'm sure you've touched on on many occasions already, non-judgmental, person-centered care. That's the core of what we're doing. And we do this specifically through a community-based approach. Um, without the peer workers, our operations are useless. We are 100% based on the people who use drugs themselves in the front line. Um, getting people into our programs, uh, operating in places that most of us can't even get into. And then what is something I really put in, in, in a specific focus on is that we believe that the community is not only um, an, an enabling ele element in our, in our programs, we want to make sure that the community can carry their own voice because we are an international humanitarian medical organization. There is no point for us to stay in Afghanistan, Myanmar, Cote d'Ivoire, forever. It's just not our role. We need to make sure that the community at some point can pick up their own voice, defend their own rights, and so MDM can step out. Now, that's very easy to say. It's not always as easy to be done in the real world. Um, just a, a quick taste of what our programs look like, but I have an eye on, my, on the time, so I will not... Um, speak too long but you're all aware the, the the harm reduction approach comes with a comprehensive approach so often it starts in uh, i think these are pictures from kenya um you have obviously your outreach teams people find themselves often in open scenes like in france you have a few of them i think that the the open scene the crack scene in paris is probably most similar to what we see in a lot of uh, low middle income countries um this is where you provide syringes, you collect syringes, we work with peers, and most importantly, and I really like this picture, is this is where we connect with people. So before we even speak about hepatitis C, 
fancy treatments, all sort of, you know, nerdy, different ways of, of, you know, research and all of this. This is the core. You need to first meet people in the field. This is where it all starts. And this is a really big part of what we do, what our teams do every time in, in all the different programs. This program we closed in Kenya because the, the government was quite progressive at some point. So we thought that we could move out. From outreach teams, on outreach settings, we often have what we call drop-in centers. I think you can probably compare it with a carut in, in France, where sometimes you provide food, but really it is all about just people having a few moments of not having to look over their shoulder all the time, not being beaten up. And this is where they can meet a doctor. This is where we can find some dignity. And this is where we provide education in all different sorts and, and ways. There's a lot of different education activities that happen in these in these sites because it's a very important thing and it, it fits within our perspective of um, empowerment. So people, you know, their own knowledge will defend them better. And and all of that is for us the foundation then to start talking about medical intervention. So this is one of our programs. I think it was in probably Georgia, where we had a really important hepatitis C treatment program um, that comes with. Doctors, nurses, some places we have uh, laboratory facilities, and in some places, if we don't provide it in-house, because we don't necessarily want to provide a parallel system, um, sometimes we also bring people then with the help of peers into uh, the, the health system. And obviously, all of that, we can't move ahead if there is not a component of, of activism and uh, defending the, the the subject of harm reduction on a global scale so that was my baseline to talk about very shortly i think i have a bit more time now um on three a focus on three countries where we will look specifically on hepatitis c um so the yellow countries this is a new program funded by unit aid and we do this together with input the international network of people use drugs burnett institute which you guys might know it's a very famous um research institution from australia and another team we work with a lot in is the University of Bristol and particularly the, 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 the Professor Peter Vickerman who does a lot of mathematical modeling among people who use drugs. We have a, a, a long established relation working with all these um, different institutions. So it starts this year and it will go up to 2027. I won't read you the title, it's too long and complicated, but what it is all about, and this is, let's cut right into it. The three major components to what we're going to do. So as you as you saw, it, it will be in Tanzania, Georgia, and Armenia. We will focus on three different areas. All of the areas are um, designed as, as a research and needs to bring new innovations, new ways of doing it. The first one to have a quick focus on is the long acting buprenorphine. Now, I think I've seen in your program that you've already spoken quite a bit about long-acting propenifin. For us, the bottom line is that a lot of the knowledge that we have currently in long-acting propenifin is in high-income countries. So what we would like to do with this program is introducing long-acting propenifin in Tanzania and then focus on specifically the values and preferences of the community. There is a lot of data um, conflicting each other at this point. Some people they swear with this new drug that will solve all the problems, which in reality often only solves the limitation of people to be able to take home their own doses currently. But there's a lot of positive um, feedback coming from the potential that it is long acting. And then on the other hand, you have a lot of people that actually it isn't that magic and it isn't immediately the, the, the my first uh, choice for some people. So we want to introduce this in a low middle income country and then specifically look into is that something that the community really wants or is that something that is mostly based on the agenda of pharmaceutical company that wants to push this forward so it's very interesting we're very excited about this um, we will start hopefully later in the year introducing the first um, treatments in in tanzania and we will also look into some of the efficiency but I think it is important to put an asterisk to this because a lot of the efficiency data that I see coming out is people comparing buprenorphine with methadone, which I don't think is necessarily the best way of looking into it because they're two different things and you don't want to end up 
comparing apples with pears. So that we will look into it anyhow to see in some level of efficiency. But I don't want to come into a place like, oh, this is better than methadone. No, there's two two different people. Some do really well with methadone, some do really well with propinephine, and we should not start comparing one as being better than the other one. So that's the main focus for the long-acting propinephine in, in Tanzania. Then to jump into another subject, low dead space syringes. Les serang, les, how do you say this again? Serang and espesmor, je crois. I'm trying to help the translator. So <laughs> this is, uh, I think a lot of you already know the concept of it. So here's methadone. This is the uh, low dead space syringes. I know that in France, we provide quite a few already. This is a recommendation from the WHO since, if I'm not mistaken, 2012 or something in the range like it, maybe even longer. So the theory is simple. If you provide a syringe that has a high dead space, so it's like an empty space in which the blood remains once you're done with your injection, then the more blood remains in your syringe, the more virus, the more risk if somebody else uses that syringe to transmit virus. It's very simple logic, but based on these recommendations, it never really took up very well globally. So we would like to give this a bit of a push on a global on a global level, and we will introduce low dead space syringes in Georgia, Armenia, and Tanzania, and we will look into again same thing values and preferences of the community. That's all led by researchers from input um, to really get onto the table what is important to the community. Why would they shift to a low dead space syringe or why would they not? And that is really key because there has been some pilots in the past where they provided the low dead space syringe, but they were not at all adapted to the community. So they didn't want them. And then it was sort of translated into people don't like low dead space syringes. No, that, that is not the case. We need to make sure that we provide the right low dead space syringes that are adapted to the local context. So there's um, a lot of work around the values and preferences and then what we would like to approach, but I really, we need to be careful to see if we if we would be able to achieve is to see if we can have a measure, um, an effect size on incidence. So what would happen if you change all high dead space syringes to low dead space syringes, what is happening with your epidemic? Very easy to say. It's incredibly hard to get the data on this. It's it's quite complicated to have enough statistical power to 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 make um, causal relations. So we, I'm really excited about this in the sense of it is such a simple intervention. If we would, in some ways, first of all, be able to identify what are the values and preferences of the community so we can really make sure that if we introduce it in any country we know that we introduce it in a way that it is adapted to the community and they will actually use them and on top of it if potentially we would we would know what impact it would have on the incidents that would be a real game changer and even if the low dead space areas would only provide a tiny bit of reduction in your incidents if you would introduce this on a global scale it could have a massive impact so I'm very, very excited about this component. It's a very simple concept. And I think that you know, there's no reason why not to provide a low dead space syringe. So that brings me to the last component. And I'm showing you just a picture of a cascade of care. This is just a dummy picture. It is no real data from anywhere. But we're all aware with the cascade of care where you know, first of all, you have all people and then the people that were reached via services and then the people that has received the test and then the people that know their status, et cetera, et cetera. So there's one specific area where we see an enormous gap. And that is the moment between somebody getting a first rapid test and the step into people actually starting treatment. There's quite a gap there. For two reasons, we think. One, because we lose people out of sight because once a rapid test is positive, then we have to take an appointment and they have to go to a laboratory, et cetera, et cetera. Most of the time, there's a lot of time going over that and then we lose people. The other reason is in low middle income country settings, PCR tests, um, confirmatory tests are sometimes still quite expensive. So they're not as easily available for everyone. So what we will do in this setting is quite, um, yeah, it's a really new way of looking into this. What there is some preliminary data that suggests if you take the rapid test of OraQuick, usually you would read the outcomes after 20 minutes. Now, if you look at the outcomes at five minutes, if at that time point 
the rapid test is already positive, the probability that that person is not only obviously antibody test positive, but as well carrier of the disease is slightly higher than, than the ones that are only getting positive at 20, 20 minutes. So what we would like to do is to compare people that would go the normal pathway and then compare it with people that would be taken at the time point of five minutes and immediately start treatment, no PCR. It's a very radical way of doing things. We would go from a rapid test, reading them for five minutes. If it's positive, we would give them treatment immediately. And then we would, in the end, want to compare like, okay, what happens? How many people would we potentially over treat that are not really in need of treatment? So it's quite a radical way of looking into it. Um, but yeah, again, very excited about this and, and see what we will find out. Just to finish with this, I'm sorry. I hope I stick a little bit to the time. When I talk about this, I get very enthusiastic, so I can't stop. But um, here is a, an, an online course I just wanted to put out there. Feel free to take a picture and you've got the English and the French version to sign up to. So yeah, that's it for me and uh, feel free to for any questions. Merci beaucoup, Ernst. Des questions dans la salle ou sur le ou sur l'estrade? Questions for Ernst? Yes, Louis. Louis Montaner. Can you expand on what you meant by community acceptability, the, that the syringes, when they were launched, they were not accepted? What, what led to that? What are your thoughts about what makes a syringe community friendly versus not community friendly? Thank you. Yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot to it, actually. Um, the example I was talking about specifically is... Um, there is the very simple classic low dead space syringe that we see in many in many places is the insulin syringe you know the very thin one mil syringe so that is the most accessible low dead space syringe and what happened is that for instance in Myanmar where people use a five mil barrel they use it they take out the plunger they put in the powder then they put the water they put the powder back they shake and that's how they inject so it's if you do this with this low dead space syringe of one millimeter, milli, uh, milliliter, yes, then it, it, it doesn't work. I mean, if you're outside and there's a windy environment, you need to get the powder into this tiny little back of the of the syringe, and then you give an even thinner one. I mean, it was an obvious an obvious no go. So it, it didn't work at all, and I thought it was just so badly done this kind of pilots. But unfortunately, these things are. There's a lot of layers behind it, right? You have the global fund that thinks, oh, this is great. Let's try low dead space errands. It trickles down and then somebody down the line is like, oh, okay, let's pick up a low dead space errands. The only one that he has is the one millimeter. So he tries it, does a pilot and then reports back to global fund. It doesn't work. And you see how in this sort of, this pathway, you completely miss the point. And obviously, if you give somebody that's not adapted to people, then yeah, they will not use it. There's another series that I see appearing more and more. And I mean, it is such a frustration point for me. There, there's this particular syringes that if you get to the end, they click and then you can't pull the plunger back. People don't want that. They really don't want it. They, they have, I mean, if you like it or not, they want to flush in the end. So what happens is they pick up the syringe and then you have special professional injectors, they call them, they have razor blades and then they cut the thing before they use it. So there's a lot of manipulation, there's sharp items, there's somebody with a laser, uh, razor blade, and all of this adds a lot of risks to it. So, yeah, you really need to look into what does the community want, what is adapted, and how do you really reduce the risk? That is ultimately the purpose. Sorry, it's a long answer. I can talk about this for hours. <laughs> Merci. Une autre question. Thank you. Another question. Bart, I'm at University of Minnesota in the United States. Uh, could, could you describe a little bit more the uh, hepatitis C programming in, in the settings where you're 
going to be implementing the long-acting injectable buprenorphine. Uh, I'm aware that some settings continue to have directly observed therapy for their uh, hepatitis C treatment. And if the buprenorphine is the medication that keeps people coming back and they're getting long-acting injectable, uh, will they be coming back for their hepatitis C treatment? Excellent points. That is exactly one of my questions because OAT, I mean, I definitely don't promote daily provision of OAT. If somebody uh, is capable to, you know, have multiple days, they should get multiple days. Um, it's a big frustration point of many of the activists why we keep treating people as children and not just give treatment as they have the right to get treatment. But having said that, it is true that if you look at the data, daily OAT combined with ARV or daily other DAAs, um, you get very high retention rates. How would that work with long-acting bupropenone? Um, I I think that the 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 advantage, first of all, is that now the DA is, is we will use soft file, so it's only twelve weeks, and during a period of twelve weeks, we often get very good results. Sometimes, if people are still very active users and not using methadone so it's kind of even you know it's more complex than what we're talking about here we sometimes have peer workers that know where they are and they provide a treatment even in the hot spots so that's as far as you can go with it with an outreach model really um but it's definitely something that we will look into and it's one of the things that we will uh, yeah report on and and that's part of our feasibility components that burnett will look into how does that work um I'm I'm really curious if if we would see a difference. Now I have to say our sample sizes are not that massive, so I'm not sure if we will have very conclusive settings. But um, where we work, most like I described earlier, a lot of people operate a lot in the in the in these open scenes, hotspots. So we often know where to find people. It's not like they they go away and then we have no idea where they are. So I'm I'm fairly optimistic that we might be able to that we might not see any difference and in you know for us it is really worth it to have that really strong community model where you have peer workers that are constantly in the hotspots and they will know where people are and so we we're not we will not be completely powerless like oh we have no idea where they are and, and they will stop treatment but it's a really good point because that's something i'm, I'm thinking about as well okay uh Merci beaucoup, Hans. Uh, thanks a lot. It was really interesting. We, we, maintenant, nous, nous devons avancer un now peu. we must uh, carry on. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we're running a, a little late. I'm going to ask Perrine to, to join us. She's the research director at INSERM System slash UMR 912 in Marseille, everybody knows her well here for all the work she did with her colleagues on drug uses and especially lately on chemsex. Thank you, Perrine. Merci beaucoup. Um, Thank you very much. You have 20 minutes. Thank you very much to uh, Jean-Pierre, Orkai, Cecilia for the invitation and for organizing this Congress. Thank you very much, Gilles, for a very short introduction and our work on CAMSAX. So CAMSAX, in a way, is at the crossroads between fight against VIH, or HIV rather, and risk reduction related to drug use. And for that reason, is a theme that is of high interest for our team, the intercom team within SUSTAIN, which is the body in which I work. So I'm going to discuss prophylaxis and what we call PRAP, background information. For those of you who are not familiar with that theme, um, it's a sexual practice and general definition as we go here is the use of psychoactive substances in a sexual context with again the intention of having sex under the influence of those drugs. This definition was proposed by David Stewart some 15 years ago uh, from a London team. And so today it applies to MSM, men who have sex 
them. So it's a real phenomenon, even if, of course, well, it does create a lot of fascination to see those headlines that you read in the media, and it has a lot of fantasies around, around those parts. It's real, it does exist, it's a true and real question, which requires some scientific, well, requires scientific data and, and evidence. So it's not black and white, there are different profiles of, of those individuals uh, with this practice and practices that can also be very diverse. We have data from the PAX study that we conducted at team plus the year study by OFDT, named of the study is Apaches. But we know that public health responses to that are not adapted to those practices. Therefore, it is very important that we can produce scientific data to meet those needs and uh, that those data are harvested with um, community-based organization. In literature, scientific literature, we read that gen sex is associated to a number of health complications, infections like HIV, but also hepatitis C, and also uh, somatic problems because of uh, the drug use, but also psychiatric comorbidities. A very nice paper by Kiber, 2019, show that MSM who uh, practice chem sex have psychosocial vulnerabilities. And I was very fortunate to be able to demonstrate uh, the impact of COVID on this specific population. They were very badly hit by this, uh, in, in this period of time, increase of consumption, um, deterioration in their mental health. And so there's a report by Santé Publique France, which demonstrates the uh, deleterious impact of COVID on this specific MSN population. Also the scientific population or researchers demonstrate again that public health response is not sufficient. We need to have a better understanding of those practices to then again have a better adapted response. Now with PrEP, uh, I would like to show the connection between chemsex and PrEP and the role of PrEP in the answer that we may have to that situation. So those are the research questions and uh, we were able to have a few answers to, to those questions thanks to three large studies to which we were associated as, as a partner. So there's the uh, clinical study uh, named HyperGay, and one of the research questions was, uh, uh, is on-demand prep suitable tool for MSM with his chem sex? Question two was differences between MSM with, uh, with and without chem practices, and we, um, as, as a criteria, was a prep use and HIV status. And question three, among MSM who use prep, which are then their journey or trajectory. And uh, we have a cohort financed by NRS, which is a health body in France. The Prevenir cohort was one of the uh, cohorts looking at question three. Now, question one, as I said, is PrEP a suitable tool for MSM uh, doing chemsex? So as we said before, we were a partner to that um, a research program. The uh, clinical uh, study was named NRS IPERG, was a randomized controlled trial conducted in France and Canada at the time. And again, there was on demand prophylaxis uh, for MSM with uh, at risk activities or practices. Molina in 2015 published a paper on. Uh, effectiveness. And then I used those data to try and understand the connection between PrEP and CAMSAX. So the inclusion criteria as uh, are detailed here are HIV and negative men, MSM, age 18 is over, at high risk of um, being infected by uh, HIV. Data collection was online questionnaire every second month in order to better understand the uh, sexual behaviors and the compliance with PrEP. So the objective was to study the association of correct PrEP use and CAMSEX practice. Uh, method is described here, 331 participants, MSM. They were selected based on the criteria show career 
and we could demonstrate that 29% self-report, but they had had chem sex during follow-up, and 8% reported that they did inject uh, during sex, and this is what they call slam. Those are the uh, results of the uh, multivariate uh, analysis. You can see at the bottom that chem sex is a practice still used during PRAP, and this is adjusted with all confounding parameters um, that are detailed here. Now, this first question, is PrEP an adapted tool for MSM? Well, uh, it seems that those MSM use PrEP correctly, so it is a suitable tool for this public. However, we need to pay a closer attention to those younger individuals and those feeling depressed, because apparently this is a factor which makes for a, a less good use of PrEP. Second question was uh, differences between MSM with and without chemsec practices. How did we answer this question? Thanks to a survey conducted by Sandé, uh, Santé Publique France. Um, it's a survey which is available, which has been available and is running by um, waves, so to speak. So we have a yearly survey. This is uh, those are the data from 2021. Again, uh, these inclusion criteria are described here. The enrollment is made uh, mostly online through social media. So, of course, it's targeting the most connected MSM. So, short online questionnaire. And amongst the question, uh, definition of GenFax was the following during the last six months, except alcohol. Have you consumed those drugs? Uh, in sexual context, uh, mostly GHB, but also cocaine and, and others, for example, amphetamines. In the questionnaire, we would uh, try to assess indicators of mental health, for example, suicide attempts, and uh, a question to try and assess the anxiety. Comparison between uh, MSM with and without game sex, so uh, so cam sexes versus non-cam sexes, just to make our life easier and have a shorter uh, term. So in a population of 1,494, 1, 1,500 and slightly more were identified as cam sexes. So those cam sexes are older, more educated, mostly live in uh, larger cities from a professional point of view, more difficult situation, I, either unemployed or uh, not currently working. Um, and uh, sex practices, they tend to uh, have sex in groups and they also are frequent users of internet websites and have more occasional partners. Now, health-related uh, data, those uh, individuals have at-risk practices, and they are probably are aware of that because they have a uh, more frequent screening for uh, sexually transmissible uh, diseases. So you have the uh, HIV uh, status for seronegative individuals. They tend to use more PrEP, mental health, more suicide attempts and an anxiety score which is higher in chem sexes compared to non chem sexes. Now, as a summary of what I just said, comparison between CX and non CX, uh, you have HIV status here and PrEP use. Interestingly, uh, CH individuals are more aware of their current HIV uh, status. They tend to be more HIV positive. The other group, and for those that are zero negative, they mostly prep, they mostly use prep to protect themselves from HIV. So CX are older, live mostly in cities, and have more difficult financial situations. They have what we could say is a higher sexual activity and and, and poor health. You should know that uh, those uh, CX individuals uh, use a screening and PrEP when they are HIV negative, probably to protect themselves from HIV. The last question that we had was amongst MSN who use PrEP, what is the 
chemsex trajectory. Uh, and this is important to understand the differences in the challenging blood practices over time. We also are a partner to a cohort study entitled Prevenir. So this is a follow-up of a number of uh, MSM. So it's a cohort which was initially recruited in May 2017, and the main goal is to assess effectiveness, employers, and adherence safety of PrEP. So question is, are administered on a quarterly basis, and they are uh, well, self-reported online. We are following up 3, 000, over 3,000 individuals, 3,193. And for the uh, trajectories, we have uh, shortlisted uh, 2,633 MSM. We have different descriptions to, of those trajectories and the number of variables or covariates. Vari so we use either um, fixed data or data that are bound to be all over time. And those results demonstrate four types of trajectories. A trajectory uh, according to which GameSax is going to be performed on a sustained uh, manner over time uh, and rather stable. Uh, so this is the orange one on top. Uh, another tra trajectory where they are decreasing their practice, one increasing, and then this is compared to a form, if you will, of control group of those MSM. Um, we never do uh, CX. Results are in the process of being published. They are pretty uh, complex. So I'm just trying to provide you, uh, I would say, a simplified results. The trajectory of those uh, having uh, CX often compared to those uh, never having a case, they are older, they have a higher perception of risks associated to sex, and they use more uh, erectile dysfunction medication. They have a continuous use of PrEP and not so much on demand, which is consistent with uh, a practice of CX. Those in the green lines are decreasing over time, this, those MSM are younger, more depressed, and they mostly use on-demand PrEP. And those uh, with an increased use, it's mostly, again, in younger individuals, less depressed, and they also use uh, PrEP, well, they used PrEP before they were included in the cohort, so they are used to using PrEP. Key messages you have uh, summarized here. So we have four groups of MSM, and those groups describe different journeys. They also show a different um, adaptation or adaptation to uh, PrEP. So we have a good compliance and a good adaptation to PrEP for those in the orphan territory, so the uh, orange group. But we need to pay a specific attention to those younger MSM, those starting CRX, and also MSM with depressive symptoms, because we were able to demonstrate that they sort of um, use PrEP less often. The data also show but it's important to uh, organize and design different um, studies to uh, better understand the motivation for CAMSAX and also try and make a better connection between depression and, and CAMSAX. My conclusions. We see that amongst uh, MSM uh, practicing CAX, we have at risk behaviors, but apparently they are able to uh, adopt prevention tools, uh, so PrEP and also status of testing. The so PrEP, if we emphasize that PrEP is a good opportunity to uh, offer tools for harm reduction, I think it's important that we do not forget MSM 
who are uh, HIV positive, and we know that HIV positive individuals are not the main target of PrEP. So we should not forget about those. Um, we need to take into account the uh, psychosocial vulnerabilities, and we have little data about mental health and uh, CX. Therefore, the uh, last question that we'd like to answer uh, through uh, a different cohort in the process of recruiting is which are the psychosocial or societal factors that explain complicated uh, trajectories. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Perrine. Are there questions in the public? Seems to be the case, Gavin. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation, Gavin Bart, University of Minnesota, United States. Um, in, in your trajectory uh, work, you identified things like depression, erectile yeah. uh, dysfunction medications. I didn't see slam sex in there. What, no. Is it that slam sex didn't correlate or it wasn't separately analyzed compared to chemsex who are not injecting? So we, we haven't uh, included the slam in this uh, trajectories uh, model. So it's, uh, as I, I explained in the hypergeco um, uh, clinical trial, uh, it's a, a minority uh, um, a phenomenon, uh, but in this uh, trajectory models, uh, it was not. It was for chemsex in general, but not uh, uh, regarding injection. But we probably we will analyze injection in a, a, um, a further analysis. Hello, thank you for your presentation, um, Jason Farrell from Amsterdam. Um, in the Netherlands, we've had pretty good um, success in PrEP, except there's been a very long waiting period for a national program. And that's caused some concerns. Um, one of the major issues that have been brought to the attention of many people in public health is condomless anal sex and getting people to use condoms uh, while on PrEP. Um, have you had any issues of success or any um, adapted your intervention to address these uh, issues? Um, so this, the uh, Prevenir co uh, cohort that I presented um, have some data regarding uh, condomless anal sex uh, and of course, uh, there are, uh, during this cohort, a lot of follow-up uh, visit uh, where uh, it is important to, to uh, remind the, the different way of uh, being protected from, uh, from HIV and from uh, STI, because I, I forgot to, to talk about that, but it's very important, the STI uh, sexually uh, transmitted infection. Uh, but it's an issue because some of uh, the uh, chemsexers that are in the uh, often the often trajectory, uh, they uh, do not use a condom at all, and uh, and yes, it's a, so it's a result from the cohort. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Perrine. Uh, et, uh, et on va pouvoir passer. Thank you very much, Perrine. And now we are going to give the floor to Don De Jolly from New York. He's always bringing some interesting views from overseas. Don, yeah, the floor is yours. Hello. Uh, first, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me. Uh, I think this is a wonderful conference, and I'm happy to be uh, back here again. Uh, I'll be talking about what happened among people who inject drugs during the COVID epidemic in New York. Uh, New York was a hotspot for COVID transmission. It had the highest fatality rates in the country, and it also had among the most severe lockdown measures. Uh, everybody was told to stay home. You we're not supposed to go to work unless you were an essential worker. Uh, everybody was wiping their vegetables with Clorox 
uh, wipes to make sure that you didn't get it from uh, handling vegetables or eating vegetables. Uh, everybody was wearing masks and the streets were deserted. So all of these uh, events led us to wonder what will happen with people who inject drugs during this period. Okay. And okay, prior to COVID-19, things were actually going very, very well with HIV in New York. Uh, the, there was extremely low HIV incidence, less than 0 0.1 per 100 person years at risk. Uh, we did mathematical modeling using agent-based models to see the likelihood of an outbreak, and the likelihood was uh, under 0.25% of having an outbreak of as many as 20 people. Uh, prior to COVID, we were seeing changing in patterns of drug use with uh, fentanyl increasing and heroin decreasing. Uh, the low HIV incidence in New York was due to a number of factors. There was a very, very small number of people who were capable of transmitting HIV. That is that they were HIV positive, they were not on ART, and they were doing distributive sharing of their needles and syringes. That was less than 1% of the population. Uh, we also had generally low rates of uh, sharing needles and syringes. And the sharing that did occur was typically within small stable groups, like a sexual pair or three or four close friends. As long as those groups were stable, you would see almost no HIV transmission because they would be seroconcordant. Either everybody would be HIV positive or everybody would be HIV negative. And if you didn't have change within the group, uh, you would not get HIV transmission. Uh, we also had uh, great HIV prevention services with lots of syringe exchange. Uh, those were interrupted during the pandemic, uh, particularly during the initial lockdown, uh, but they quickly recovered. Uh, typically, the syringes exchanges were shut down for a week or two, then they went back up, and we actually had more syringes distributed in 2020 the first year of the pandemic than we did in 2019, so that the services did recover very quickly. Uh, after 2019, when, the, when COVID hit, uh, there were the lockdowns I mentioned, and it was harder to reach PWID with prevention services. Uh, we saw continuing emergence of illicitly manufactured fentanyl and increases, great increases, in fatal drug overdoses. And we've been seeing more and more xylazine, which is uh, typically mixed with fentanyl. So the objective of this study was to look at what happened with respect to HIV transmission, COVID vaccination, uh, and illicit drug use during the first three years of the COVID pandemic. We recruited subjects through modified respondent-driven sampling. We did regular respondent-driven sampling and also sent staff out to do uh, staff recruiting. Uh, the staff would use RDS coupons. Uh, we enrolled into a serial cohort study with two uh, visits, a baseline and a follow-up. We're now thinking of increasing the number of follow-up visits. We have a structured questionnaire that covers standard demographics, drug use behavior, uh, COVID uh, vaccination. And the people uh, self-reported their HIV and HCV status. Uh, we did urine testing for multiple drugs, including fentanyl and xylazine. We did blood draws for HIV, HCV, and SARS, COVID, uh, coronavirus 2 antibody testing. And we also did qualitative interviews uh, on overdose fentanyl and xylazine. 
For HIV incidents, we first ask people about their HIV status. The great majority of people who were HIV positive said they knew that they were HIV positive, that they were HIV positive before the pandemic, and that they were on ART before the pandemic. So for those people, we considered them to not been, have not been at risk during the pandemic. Uh, it was only people who reported that they believed they were HIV seronegative at the start of the pandemic and who were seropositive when we tested them uh, that we considered to be people who had seroconverted during the pandemic. And the time at risk for uh, calculating incidents was from the time of the start of the pandemic to the time that people were tested. 60% uh, of our respondents re lived in either Manhattan or Brooklyn. They had a mean age of 49 years, so that they were uh, a somewhat elderly group for uh, PWID. Uh, pretty much even distribution by race and ethnicity. Uh, almost 70% reported that government benefits was their primary source of income. 67% reported food insecurity in the last six months, 45% reported unstable housing, and an additional 30% reported that they were living with friends or relatives so that they did also did not have great housing, so that there was great economic disadvantage uh, among these people. Okay, in terms of COVID vaccination, New York City had among the highest rates of vaccination of any city in the country. Uh, with 81% fully vaccinated among our PWID sample, that was almost identical with 78% fully vaccinated. In terms of receiving boosters, which is considerably more challenge, it was 40% uh, in the city as a whole and 37% among our samples. So given all of the disadvantages that our subjects had, they were still getting vaccinated at rates essentially comparable to the city as a whole. In terms of HIV transmission, we had only two people who said that they were HIV negative before the start of the pandemic who were HIV positive when we tested them. So that gave us uh, 800 some years, person years at risk or an HIV incidence rate of 0.24 per 100 person years at risk. Uh, this is a very low rate. The, in the work we've done on end, ending epidemics, we consider a rate of 0.5 per 100 person years at risk to mean the end of an HIV epidemic among PWID. So during the pandemic, uh, we still were at an end of the HIV epidemic rate among our subjects in New York. In terms of our fentanyl testing, overall, we had 82% were tested positive for fentanyl in uh, the urine test. That was slightly higher among those who said that heroin or speedball was their drug of choice. That was 86%. It was also uh, disturbingly high among people who said that their primary drug was cocaine or methamphetamine. It was over 50% in that group who reported they were not using heroin or not much heroin. Uh, still more than half of them were fentanyl positive. And for the small number of people whose main drug was other drugs, there was at 77% uh, fentanyl positive. Uh, we've, in 2021, we had 2,600 uh, fatal overdoses in the city, that has now gone up to close to 3,000. Uh, we did look at non-fatal overdoses in our sample. 61% had had a non-fatal overdose sometime in their lifetime. 24% reported that they'd had a non-fatal overdose in the six months before the interview. And 39% reported a non-fatal overdose during the pandemic. So we were seeing a tremendous number of non-fatal overdoses that are consistent with the fatal overdoses that we see in the city. 
in terms of predictors or factors associated with non-fatal overdoses, by far the strongest association was with having previous non-fatal overdoses with an odds ratio of 10.4. Our subjects reported taking actions to try to prevent overdoses. 95% uh, reported that they had taken at least one action. 65% uh, reported carrying naloxone. 40% reported injecting with or near others. 16% um, reported using fentanyl test strips. However, they uh, felt that that wasn't particularly effective because almost all the drugs that they were going to use had fentanyl in them so that using a fentanyl test strip did not really provide new information. Uh, only 11% used test shots to see how strong their drug was. Uh, so that was not particularly uh, used. It's a little too early to assess whether these behaviors are changing the overdose situation. We've done analysis of the fentanyl epidemic in Estonia, where the epidemic has been going on for about 12, 13 years. And in Estonia, we saw a rapid increase in fatal overdoses when fentanyl was introduced into the country. That then leveled off, uh, but it stayed at a high level. It did not drop down to uh, pre-fentanyl levels uh, so that we think that a similar thing will happen in New York. We will see a leveling off of fatal overdoses, but it's unlikely that we will go back to the level of overdoses uh, prior or to fentanyl. Uh, xylazine is a large animal tranquilizer. 32% of our urine tests showed positive for xylazine. Uh, the one good thing about that is it has not gone up in the last five months. Uh, xylazine can increase the chances of a fatal overdose because it does depress respiration. It's typically mixed with fentanyl because it leads to a perceived longer duration of the effect of fentanyl so that it, it there is a reason for using fentanyl in terms of the drug effects. It can also lead to severe rooms, necrosis, ulcers, increased risk of infection. We're seeing that in uh, two to 5% of our fentanyl users. For some of them, it is extremely serious. It requires hospitalization. Uh, we have, there are cases where either a foot or a hand has to be amputated because of the ulcers and necrosis. This is very, very disturbing to our subjects. Uh, we had one subject who was self-treating using an antibiotic cream because she was afraid to go to the emergency room. She did not believe that she would be treated well if as a drug user with evidence of xylazine use, she went to a, an emergency room. She felt, well, they'll just cut off my hands and that'll be it. Uh, so that the xylene, xylazine situation represents a new and very disturbing uh, aspect of drug use in New York. We are now distributing xylazine test strips so that users will be able to know whether or not their drug has xylazine in it. We're starting follow-up to see what they do after they test pos their drugs test positive for xylazine. They've reported going back to their dealers and complaining. Uh, what we want to see over time is, is there a demand for non-xylazine fentanyl in New York? Users could have the opportunity to know what's in their drug and not buy drugs that have uh, xylazine in them. Uh, we're hoping that there would be enough demand for non-xylazine drugs that dealers would decide they would make more money by selling fentanyl without xylazine in it. 
Uh, that's something we will be uh, studying over the next year or so, that can we influence the economics of drug distribution by giving users the chance to know whether their drugs contain xylazine and set up a demand for xylazine-free drugs. Okay, uh, to summarize, during the COVID pandemic in New York City, we started that pandemic with great concern that it would lead to total chaos in the drug uh, scene with uh, a lot more HIV transmission. Instead, we found successful vaccination for COVID. The, we maintain a very, very low rate of uh, HIV transmission. However, fentanyl has become the dominant drug. It's very, very difficult to find heroin in New York now. And we do see a tremendous increase in overdoses. We expect that to level off, but we don't really expect it to go back down. Uh, xylazine is clearly making the situation worse. Uh, we're searching for ways to uh, deal with that. We think that distributing the xylazine test strips at least gives people who use drugs the opportunity to know what's in their drug and try to adapt their behavior to it. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. It's very enlightening and a different uh, behavior than uh, here. Please go ahead. Yes. Mr. Desjardins, uh, you said that uh, fentanyl was discovered in many, many drugs like uh, cocaine or heroin. Is it also the case with xylazine? Is xylazine uh, very often discovered in, in any drugs used by drug users? Uh, xylazine is almost all, always associated just with fentanyl. We're not seeing it with cocaine or methamphetamine and such. So the xylazine is essentially just with fentanyl. Uh, however, we're now seeing fentanyl in almost all drugs. So it may be, uh, may be going to spread, but uh, our urine testing is showing a fairly constant 30 some percent of the urines that we test are uh, xylazine positive. So we expect it probably will be strongly associated with fentanyl, but there probably will not be enough fentanyl in things like powder cocaine or crack cocaine that there would be enough uh, xylazine in those drugs uh, to show up in urine testing. But again, that's an open question as to uh, what the drug market does. Uh, it's clearly been undergoing dramatic changes in the last five years. And I think the safest prediction would simply we're going to be seeing a lot more synthetic drugs and other drugs coming into the system that the old days of it's only heroin and cocaine are well past us. How easy is it to get these vet drugs in the US? To uh, get which drugs? For how easy is it to get these veterinary drugs in the USA? Oh, it is very difficult to not get them. <laughs> <laughs> if you okay. go out and, and buy drugs from a street dealer, you really should expect that there's going to be fentanyl in it. Even if you think you're buying uh, barbiturates in pill form, uh, there's a good chance it'll be fentanyl. So it, it, people have quit using the uh, fentanyl test strips because they think there's just fentanyl in everything. Impressive. Yes, okay, two questions. Uh, lady, uh, ladies first. Thank you. Um, Sandy Comer from Columbia University in New York. So the xylazine problem uh, has been in existence in Puerto Rico for 20 years or so. Is there anything that we can learn from their experience to help us? Uh, we've talked to our Puerto Rican 
uh, users, and they have not given us anything yet. Just that they have sort of adapted to the fentanyl situation. Uh, we keep interviewing them with the hopes that somebody will come up with something uh, positive. Uh, we haven't come across it yet. The, the one good thing that uh, we have seen is that, that xylazine has not increased above that 30% in the five months we've been doing testing. Uh, Puerto Rico never had uh, xylazine test strips so that New York has an advantage of now our people who use drugs at least have the opportunity of knowing what they're using. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay, here. Yeah. Hello. Thank you. Thank you, Don. That was very informative. Uh, one question about the COVID vaccination program. How and where did the homeless drug injectors uh, receive their vaccinations? The health department sent outreach workers into the shelters to do to encourage vaccination, set up appointments, and sometimes even doing the vaccinations uh, there so that the city health department did make a concerted effort really to get to homeless people uh, and, and get them vaccinated. And were vaccinations available at the syringe programs? Uh, it is available, some, not all. I mean, all of them can make appointments and during the early days, it was hard to get an appointment. Uh, but there are, are, program, are syringe programs now that do vaccination, and all of them can help you uh, get an appointment now. And it's very easy to get an appointment now. Thank you. Uh, Bruno Millet from Paris. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. I just want to know... What does it bring to, to patients to add xenazine to uh, fent fentanyl, in your opinion? What, what does it bring to, to patients? What does it add to... Uh, what does it, in terms of uh, feeling? What, what... Okay, fentanyl does produce a considerably stronger drug effect than heroin, and fentanyl is much cheaper to produce than heroin. It is... Uh, considerably more potent and therefore you if you're smuggling it into the country you have to smuggle much less so it has many advantages from the distributors uh, point of view from the users point of view it clearly does produce a stronger drug effect and some people like that others don't like it but the economics are such that uh, fentanyl has essentially replaced heroin. Yes, and one more and last question because we'll have to cope with time. Uh, okay, where is it? Yeah, here is it. There is two, 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 two offers. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Bonjour, Christelle Deston, pour Soas, moi je vais parler en... Hello, I'm going to speak French. I have a question regarding the number of people enrolled in your study. And I would like to know about the test distribution. How many people are you reaching with this test distribution? Then how many persons in your study? Uh, we are up to about 420 right now, uh, and we are continuing. We will continue this study for, for the next two to three years. But uh, the 400 gives us sufficient power for statistical testing so far. And how the tests are delivered? And how Where many and tests? How many tests? How many tests? Can you deliver for a year the xylazine test? How many? Everybody is tested for fentanyl. Um, when you when you distribute the test, you said you, you were distributing Strip. the strips. How many people do you reach? Okay, as part of the research, 
we do urine testing. We test them for fentanyl, for heroin, methadone, methamphetamine, xylazine, and we give them their test results so that they know what's in their urine when we test them. Uh, the people with xylazine in their urine have almost all been surprised to uh, find to know that they uh, had fentanyl on had uh, xylazine on board. They were not surprised with fentanyl, but they were generally surprised to know that they had been taking xylazine. So that gives us some hope that giving them education about what they have been taking, giving them test strips that they can use themselves may lead to uh, hopefully some behavior changes around xylazine. I have a, a question then. Uh, in France, we are implementing drug checking services for people who use drugs. What is the situation in uh, the US? Uh, yes, we're setting it up. It is not um, widespread yet. We do have a few places in town that will do drug checking. And the giving out the xylazine test strips, I think would just by itself is the most, probably most important drug testing that we can do. Okay, thank you. It seems that New York is doing better than other places in the States, yeah? Uh, I think it is. I, uh, I would certainly have to say, I think it's doing better than Philadelphia, where xylazine is <laughs> yes, recognition by the people from Philadelphia. Uh, on the West Coast, there's an interesting development of people stopping injecting of fentanyl and smoking it. Whether or not that leads to less problems with fentanyl, less overdose, is that research is going on now. But the, the development of smoking fentanyl on the West Coast is something that uh, will be very interesting to watch. Um, okay. Thank you very much. Quite interesting. And let's, we have a break, and we have to be back absolutely at 10.45. Sorry, uh, 11.